Welcome everyone. My name is Željko Robaški and I'll be taking you through the Snakes and Magic presentation about exploration of Python's magic methods. Uh, like most of the software developers' story, uh, stories, this one starts with requirements. So we were asked to create an automation software developer kit or workflow library, basically. And the original requirements, as you might imagine, covered all of the regular things like it has to be configurable has to do some logging it has to run a certain way it has to have a specific api and so on but then we came to the fun requirements or the more specific ones which didn't go under the category of yeah we are we know how we're going to do this and one of some of those were to define automation with code uh, that is that defines basically a dynamic acyclic graph to make it use lazy evaluation of node values in that graph and to eagerly execute the nodes. Uh, that would basically mean that the uh, lazy evaluation of node values means that you should be able to continue executing one node even though if it, uh, until the point it needs the output of the different node or, and make it use eager execution making that as soon as the values are available, node should be executed and its value cal calculated. So it should also fail early. It should use no, it shouldn't be a domain specific language, which is developed additionally, and it should be written using Python. Basically, we had our hands tied together and tried to create something that's really dynamic and, and, and big. And it was all supposed to look like a regular Python code. So we decided to go step by step. If they want Python, well, okay, we'll use Python. And we needed to create a dynamic acyclic graph, meaning that we don't see that as a problem. It's going to be basically a, a class that will represent the node. We call that class a step. And it has its own like execute function, which defines what's going to happen inside of that step or that node. So that, to begin with, that looks pretty much as, as it should be. You have classes, like add class in this example, and it does some work. It defines a sum. We, dis we just decided to attach to those nodes their inputs and outputs as values. So self.sum equals sum of x and y, which are also taken from the same step. And basically this code can execute and you can create different steps and tie them together, as you can see here, by tying outputs of a single step to an input of a different step. And then using that in a parent step. So there was this thri three-dimensional like structure that you can imagine where uh, in, in one plane you connect different nodes and then each of the nodes can be a subgraph itself. So in order to control the uh, communication between the nodes, we had to turn towards the descriptor pattern uh, for those of you who might not have been familiar with it, it basically, in general, from documentation, a descriptor is an object attribute with binding beha behavior. And th the only thing you need to create the descriptor is to create uh, a class which has get, set, and or delete methods. And those methods are basically look like this. So on the descriptor level, you would implement those three uh, methods and you would be able to attach yourself to the process of accessing the attributes of a of an object basically through control controlling it through these defined functions in on the class level basically so if we think of the descriptors as such this is how it would look like so we create now the same step that we had now we have also inputs and outputs defined as descriptors and we do everything in the same way, but we have a place where we can uh, inject ourselves and control the, the process of execution. So that's all perfect and, and sounds amazing because you have a graph, you have nodes, you have uh, edges or connections between them, and, and you can go through that, but there's a slight problem with it. It's not dynamic. You don't have anything happening dynamically there. It's Python, so when you run it, it will go sequentially each and every step of the way. And we needed to make it not be just a, a, a visiting a tree structure like depth first or breadth first or whatever other 
algorithm you want to employ there. But that's why we figured, okay, so that means that step and every node has to be executed separately. It has to be a thread in itself. The challenges was to, yeah, now the communication becomes much more compl complex because you have to figure out a way how to deal with the synchronization of them and accessing the attributes and locking them and everything. So the deadlocks were a big issue in that case, but it solves stuff. If, if you run steps from the executor, as soon as the uh, inputs for that step are ready, you basically have eager execution and, and you don't have to worry about that. So we decided to do it and just use the communication between the steps through inputs and outputs as descriptors and see where it takes us. So this is how it would look like. You have a step and inside of it you have different steps. So the whole graph is there. Is there. And what's good about it is that every single step that you have, the execution function can create its own subgraph in itself. So if we want to present like how it how complex it would look it's something like this so you have uh, a, a class which which inherits from the step which is actually a thread and you have inputs and outputs defined as the descriptors to to give you control over execution and you have an execute function which defines whatever happens so in this specific example we are taking uh, x and y values adding them together and then divi dividing the sum with z so and we use that result of the, the division and return it back as the output of the step that we're currently in. So it doesn't seem too complex, does it? But how do we control when s something starts and when, when something stops? Basically, this part where we have step and we have a reference to it and then just want to access an attribute through descriptor. Well. Basically, we had to involve into uh, introducing a promise, as in so other in many other languages already exists. So, it will provide an output value, the promise, uh, to use until the real output is provided or until it has the real value, and it replaces itself with real value once it becomes available. Because it had to be Python, we had to hide this thing from our uh, users, so they shouldn't know that the promise exists as such. So this is something how the promise would look like in its like basic form. You would have, we had to define something as no value or null because, or, or to replace none because none is a viable value for some, in some cases. So it had value, which it really holds. It had subscribers because it had to know to inform others that the real value is now available. It had locks and it had events to enable the synchronization between the threads that are using it. So in code, it looks something like this. It has a couple of more like attributes that, that we added, but it's mostly everything else is just like decoration on it. So this basically now, when, when you put it like this, this actually covers our problems. It says that you have step A, which actually takes inputs from the current step and then makes a sum and that sum is available through a promise to a div div dividing later on. And this is how it goes in execution. So the left side is basically that step that the main step that we're going through and it would execute sequentially because it doesn't need anything. It doesn't need to care that the sum is going to be a promise and it's going to be return a promise and not the value itself. So Basically, it just continues on executing, but what won't start is step div because it won't have the value of input until the step add is finished. And when can a step add start execution? Well, as soon as it has its inputs. So everything goes eagerly and executes as soon as it, as it can, blocking wherever it's whenever it's needed to access the value of the promise. So basically, that's good. Because when you need a promise and you need to access its value, it sounds simple enough. You wait for it. But what happens if someone writes a code like this in their... Because to make it a dynamic graph, we have to have branching in it. We have to make it possible in two different executions on, at runtime to define how the graph is going to look. So these situations are a reality. You can ask if the sum is greater than 3. In that case, I want to divide by 3 
if it's not, I want to divide by 0 0.3. So this is a real scenario and this won't work because a because the the promise itself doesn't have a greater than overridden or any way to deal with it. So we have to what we had to do is introduce waiting on all of the potential like places where you need the real value. And that would mean that we have to go to magic methods and deal with them. And first when we started, uh, it, it was like, yeah, we need these and these. And then we really started going deep into it and, and figured out that just for the operations, there are a lot of them. And <laughs> our class becomes much, much bigger. And, and uh, most of them are really simple and, and don't seem that complex. But yeah, you just have to wait before you have a value. And then once you have the value, just propagate the operation that was executed onto the value itself and return whatever is needed. Uh, okay, now everything is perfect, isn't it? Like you have uh, your branching in the model, you can, you can create different steps and sub-steps and connect them in any way you want and, and deal with it in any way. And it's all simple Python that you don't have to think about and you don't have to worry yourself about uh, you're, you're doing your own work on synchronizing the threads and, and when the execution is going to happen, you know that it's, ha that it's going to happen as soon as it's possible. So it would be like this. You have an add which actually goes in a separate thread and, and uh, creates a result for adding and then it goes back because this place is going to wait when you access the sum because it's a promise it asks for greater than it gets into that part where you have to wait for the result and then once the ad is fi has finished the execution the value becomes available it informs back the thread that needs the value and just the execution goes on that's also good but again next question is what if promise is not just a basic type? Why, what if it's not an integer or, or uh, a float, I don't know, string? Well, if we take a look at the uh, class person, for example, which has name and age, we, I try to make it as simple as possible, uh, and we have a step that actually produces a person in some way. This example just returns a person with name John of a certain age that we provide as input. Well, in that case, if you want to try to access provider.person.name, you are not going to get it because we don't have an operator basically for, for controlling that part. But what we do have is the idea of how it should work. So uh, if we have a class uh, pr person and an object that is an instance of that class and we wrapped it as inside of the promise, well, this is something how it would look like. Ye a different thread from different places would ask for uh, like what's your name or how old you are or uh, anything else and the promise would have to say yeah I don't have a value yet I have to subscribe you to uh, one of my subscribers to know to inform you later on when I do have a value and then from the other side from the thread 4 uh, we would get the information that yes this is a person and your name is John you're 20 years old and you get that value that means that the promise would know okay now I have to replace this no value object with an actual value that needs to be provided and trigger the event that's gonna go back and and start all the subscribers and inform them what the values were so the first thread is going to get back the, the information my name is John and I'm 20 years old to thread to and so on so how do we do it basically it's a simple, just go through the Python's data model and search a bit, you'll find that if class has no, if no attribute, uh, if no class attribute is found, there's, uh, and the object's class has get attribute method, it is called to satisfy the lookup. So you have a way of controlling how you get the attributes from uh, an object. And this works good because the promise doesn't have that many things that we want skipped. So for the attributes, uh, we just have promise dot one promise one dot age is going to go into get attribute where we have to wait again and figure out uh, uh, until the what to do until the uh, real value is available and then propagate it to the real value to return that and this is good because if you think about it if you just propagate it and, and pause at that point 
if the object itself that you're querying doesn't have the attribute as either, you're going to get exception, which you would accept, uh, uh, expect, but you didn't know up until that point whether or not it's going to be an exception. So uh, our problem in this point was how to deal with the situation where we had like wait underscore uh, on, on a promise and how to not block in that case because that's something we need. And the only way we figured out how to do it is this convention. We just, uh, in, in this presentation, um, I'll just assume that it's just an underscore after suffix to the, the actual value of the attributes that we use and everything else we propagate further. So, And setting the attributes to a promise is very similar. So the, uh, in the same way where you have get attribute, you have set ATTR method, which is also called uh, instead of updating the instance dictionary directly. So it also gives you an ability if you want to assign a value to the object which is wrapped by a promise. And things can get a bit complex when you think about it and try to figure out how to let's say promises interact because this happens and uh, when you want to assign a value uh, which is actually a promise to an attribute of a different promise it, it gets a bit confusing because what has to well the first promise on the receiving ad would have to wait and block the uh, uh, set setters thread until the value is known because we don't know if it's going to be exception if it's going to what's going to happen so yeah and it's it it gets tough to follow through all the interactions between the threads when you get a lot of promises in your code and uh this is now how it would look like so basically you have a person you have a provider for that person and you get everything you can at access its attributes and it's not going to block up until the point where it needs to block where you really need to access the object inside of the promise but what happens if there's a question of is this person which i receive as an output of the step actually a person or we want to call is instance basically on that object well again things become a bit more complex because there's actually no uh, just a magic method on a promise that we could put to solve this issue. Why? Well, let's check how, how it goes with the instantiation work in py Python. Uh, basically, the object is always an instance of a class. But the problem is that the class is also always an instance of a meta class. So with that in mind, the only way to have some control of, of uh, checking is instance is to override instance check on the meta class of the ob of the class of the object that you're looking at. So that's not going to be easy because that breaks the whole idea of having the inversion of control where we can inject ourselves uh, in ourselves and our logic and control it in some way, which makes sense not to be able to control what you are from the side of the object basically but yeah just trying type and instance check that's that's that just wouldn't work so we were stuck a bit but what we figured out uh is that something that's always accessed when you're looking for uh any of the, uh, when you're looking for is instance check and through it uh, a uh, class attribute is always accessed on the object level. And that was a way where we could be sneaky a bit and try to figure out how to control that access because it would have to try to get class attribute from the promise itself. And our issue at that point was that get at ATTR will, was not going to help there because the promise already has get uh, uh, class, dunder class, and we are not able to prevent that because get ATTR only goes if you don't have an attribute on the object itself already. So there's one more magic method for managing attribute access, luckily for us, and that's get attribute, the long one. And yeah, this is, this is always uh, accessed and, and invoked whenever you are accessing any attribute and it's uh, it's quite important for the descriptor pattern as well if you 
override this in a uh, non-standard way, it can get messy. You can break the descriptor functioning, you can break, uh, you can end up in recursion like constantly and uh, yeah, you have to basically at the end of it call object.getAttribute uh, self and name, basically just propagate it to the original implementation. Uh, but do bef before that anything you want. And on top of all of that, promise that we created is still an object. We don't have a way of controlling that. And w we had to figure out a way of uh, defining if something is a promise and making, uh, uh, making it possible for knowing, uh, ma making it possible of knowing if the uh, object that we have is an instance of a promise. But this is where we got really stuck because this is not something that, that would be easy because we would have to propagate a promise to itself and not to the object wrapping the promise. So at that point, we just said, okay, we know that this check, if it's a promise, it's not going to be called from the outside ever because we want to hide the existence of a promise from our users. So what we did is a bit sneaky. It might not be the best solution. It might not be the prettiest one, but we just added uh, is promise uh, a value attribute to the promise itself. So we can we have an easy way of checking in our code of the library if it's a promise or not. So to wrap things up and just give the perspective from the top again, uh, basically we had a step which was needed as a node in our graph the step has its own execution function and we used descriptor pattern to implement the inputs and the outputs of the steps. And those inputs and outputs are used to connect those steps. So we had to make it, uh, ma make them as such that we can control the communication and the flow of the communication between the different steps, meaning that they are threads. And when you go deeper, the inputs and outputs would, would always return a promise, an, an, ob, an, uh, an instance of a class which is actually there just to uh, make false values available and to fake that we have a result up until the last moment we can. And then we have the promise itself where most of the magic happens. And <laughs> it basically, when someone is accessing the attribute, we had to use all the things that we could. We, ha we first had to control if the access is meant for the attribute of the uh, promise itself, or we needed to wait until the, uh, cl the result that we need is ready, or the value that the promise is wrapping is ready. And if it, if it was, if it wasn't for the promise, but it's, it, its object, we just propagated it further through object get attribute because remember we don't want to break anything of the regular usage of the code and then we would propagate it to any other magic methods if needed or just to get attribute and then when the value really was ready we would go directly to the value and have everything available making it look like that the value was there all along even it might have been received during the middle of execu of some other execution of other thread or the step. Is there any questions that I may answer for you? <laughs> okay, I won't make anyone <laughs> ask questions that they don't want to, but why, yeah. Why did you do it either for uh did you have any other reason to do it like that, or it was just a requirement? But the requirements were, were what I started from, so we had to make it look like Python when you use it, but it has to, had to have all the uh, eager execution, lazy evaluation stuff, so yeah, it had to be done uh, in such a manner. Yeah, I have to just make one uh, uh, mention of a person uh, Philip Tubich, I don't know, there he is. He is the other person who was working on this and yeah, we had a lot of fun with it. But yeah, but, uh, unwrangling the requirements was really <laughs> the beginning of it all because once you go deeper and deeper into how all of the things function, you find yourself wrapped up in a lot of Python documentation and a lot of peps that you have to read and read through and figure out which one was 
yeah, this one is not used in such a way any longer, and is it a old type or new type of class, and why? The, what are the differences, and a lot of th things, but mainly the the things that caught our attention was that we had to use so many magic methods and the promise to make it work the way we want to work. Uh, yeah, the, we were able to create the required uh, product that was asked of us, but uh, it wasn't completely like this. We find, found a different ways to do it, but this whole process is something that's definitely stick with us and we find it very fun. Thank you.